uh, autocracy. Uh, now, how a society exercises power differs between the democracies and uh, autocracies. In a democracy, people regularly get opportunities to change their leaders. The French had elections recently. They knew in advance when they would vote on the presidency and members of parliament. They trusted that elections would be fair. Uh, French citizens believe that if their representatives disappoint them, these representatives can be voted out and replaced. In between elections, citizens of democratic countries communicate their approval or disapproval of policies. They do this on social media. They express views through civic organizations. These organizations speak for their members by issuing policy statements, organizing marches, making donations. They communicate to political leaders through all these ways how the people feel things are uh, going. In uh, an authoritarian system, citizens don't have these options. There are no free and fair elections. Civil society is controlled, tightly controlled sometimes. Protest is banned. Critics get jailed. The press is bought and muzzled. So do dictators ever leave office? Yes, but not through elections. Dictators get toppled or they are forced to resign through a massive show of uh, force. This happens when vast numbers fill the streets and make society essentially ungovernable. Alternatively, a split in the inner circle results in the dictator's removal. What happens in the streets and in the inner circle are not mutually independent. Protests can induce splits and uh, uh, vice versa. Now, the determinants of a society's political trajectory are not necessarily transparent. Agents have incentives to hide relevant information. I'll be more specific shortly. The in these incentives to hide information are universal and they exist in all regime types. Autocracies and democracies differ, however, in the degree and uh, scope. For now, let me note that lack of transparency implies that big shifts in political power can occur suddenly with little apparent warning. Again, this is a matter of uh, degree, but political earthquakes can occur in either type of uh, regime. Uh, here are two recent examples from democracies. In the United States, Donald Trump's election uh, possibilities seemed remote to most political scientists. He ran against the political establishment. He made a point of offending elites in Washington, in academia, Hollywood, the media, military, uh, offending national heroes, and, and so many uh, more powerful players. He demonized many ethnic constituencies, such as Hispanic voters. He was known as a crook. How could such a person get elected? Now, for all this, he read the electorate better than many seasoned social scientists and politicians in both parties. He saw discontents that seasoned observers missed, he saw a path to political power by challenging the establishment. What matters here is that his election stunned uh, many people. Brexit was another uh, political earthquake. The referendum was called because mainstream politicians in London were certain it would go in favor of remaining in the EU and uh, that it would settle a bothersome controversy uh, for good. So uh, they misread the elites in, in London, misread the frustrations of voters outside of uh, uh, London. Now, the opening slide had uh, 2011 photos from Egypt. The Tahrir Square demonstration pictured in the second was part of the so-called Arab Spring. Five Arab dictators were toppled one after the other. Many others were forced to make concessions through huge uh, protests. 
civil war broke out in uh, uh, some countries, Syria and uh, uh, Libya, Yemen also. A decade later, peace is not yet returned to these countries. The revolutions and civil wars came as surprises. Intelligence agencies were caught off guard. Academics failed to foresee the uprisings. The CIA, among other intelligence organizations, missed what was uh, coming. The fall of East European communist regimes were uh, uh, was a political uh, earthquake for decades until the end of the 1980s communist rule in the Soviet empire seemed unshakable despite its inefficiencies peoples of the region saw its economic backwardness they abhorred its militarism its corruption its hypocrisy but they couldn't rebel because the risks were too high they ultimately did rebel in late 1989, as you all know, and the world was stunned. Oppressive as it was, and inefficient as it was, the system seemed unshakable in the foreseeable future. Yet, in spite of these expectations, these readings of the, of the Soviet system, it collapsed like a house of cards in one country after uh, another. Two more examples uh, of political earthquakes that shook the world. Uh, I'm picking these examples to show that they can, they can actually change the course of history. Just weeks before the Russian Revolution of February 1917, Lenin, who was uh, going to become the founding leader of the USSR, he was in exile. He told an audience in Switzerland that Russia's great explosion lay in the distant future. And I'm quoting him here, old people like myself will not live to see it. Even as the revolution that would topple the Russian monarchy was underway, day three of the demonstrations, the, the British ambassador in Russia was cabling London that Russia was stable. Uh, final example, Iran is in the news regularly. It's trying to become a nuclear power. It used to be a secular monarchy allied with the United States. It was overthrown by a, a coalition of Marxists and Islamists, but this was not foreseen. Shortly before the Iranian revolution of 1978-79, a now declassified CIA report spoke of Iran as, again, I'm quoting from the CIA report, an island of stability. In a what, what they meant was that in, in a turbulent region, Iran was the one country that the United States could uh, uh, count on. The Ayatollah Khomeini, the revolution's spiritual leader, you see him on, on the screen, uh, was in exile when the monarchy fell. He was stunned that the uprising achieved its goal. In public, he had been saying that the monarchy was uh, on the brink of uh, collapse, which makes sense given the political processes that I'm going to uh, describe. But to his own advisors, he was expressing deep reservations as late as two weeks before his return to uh, Tehran. Now, in each of these cases, books have been written to show what we should have known. We had the wrong model, we're told by many scholars. A better model would have predicted, predicted it. And many of these books say, well, my book gives the better model of you know, all the things we missed, we should, have, uh, we should uh, recognize. And uh, if we do so, we won't be surprised again, at least in, in the geography that I'm uh, studying. After 1989, one of the leading sociologists of the 20th century, Seymour Martin Lipset, claimed that we were surprised 
because we lack the right model of communism. Now, I would suggest uh, that that's not right. The right model of political systems in general, and uh, in, in this particular case, communism in general, uh, especially of autocracies, but also of democracies, uh, increasingly so, the right model predicts that we will be surprised again and again. And that's because there are systematic, universal, and timeless processes that keep us from foreseeing political earthquakes, even though in retrospect, it's obvious why they happened. As long as discontents in society are not fully visible, and as long as the political trade-offs that people make in deciding what political preferences to uh, convey, as long as these are not fully visible, political processes are gonna surprise us. There will be stunning, election outcomes, there will be unexpected coups, there will be uprisings seemingly out of nowhere. So here's my uh, uh, thesis with respect to autocracies in particular. I'll then develop the logic uh, after a policy-oriented uh, slide and after I go through the conceptual argument, I'll, I'll come back to uh, some, some policy implications. Autocracies perpetuate themselves through the suppression of open and honest discourse. In the repressive environment that keeps them going, information about people's grievances and aspirations is unreliable. Information on what keeps them in line, in other words, loyal to the regime, is also unreliable. The regime may seem stable, even though rivers of discontent are flowing just below the surface, and even though incentives to support the regime, to remain loyal to the regime are changing invisibly. Under the circumstances, political change may come suddenly in response to a shock, and possibly a shock that is trivial in, in itself. In an electoral autocracy, an electoral, an electoral surprise is unlikely insofar as elections are uh, rigged in favor of the regime. But an electoral surprise is possible if the dictator's circle of close uh, supporters is uh, divided. An intrinsically minor event may destroy a regime that it seemed repressed, and perhaps inefficient, but uh, stable. So having a correct model of autocratic repression, including its dynamics, is critical to understanding the processes that account for the stability of autocracies, but also to understanding the vulnerability, the vulnerabilities of autocracies. And that can be valuable to parties who are victimized by the repression. In the case of Russia, the victims include Russian dissidents in Russia or in exile, Russians who hate Putin and his cronies but are afraid to oppose him publicly, outside victims such as Ukraine. Now, a fuller understanding of the sources of regime stability can be valuable also to social scientists focused on political stability, conflict, political economy, area studies, and of course the list is uh, very long. Uh, intelligence agencies also have uh, much to gain. Now, a concept critical to political stability is preference falsification, a concept developed in uh, the book that uh, Timothy uh, mentioned uh, and many associated articles. Preference falsification is a performative act. It is an act 
that we as humans do in many contexts to avoid losing friends, to avoid being criticized on social media, depending on the country and context, to avoid being punished by the state and to avoid being punished by fellow citizens. On any given issue, we have a private preference. It represents, uh, in this context, what we would record in a secret ballot, a setting that is free of, that we believe is entirely free of social pressures. Suppose that we generally, we genuinely dislike the dictator in power or the regime itself or both. We won't necessarily reveal our dislike. We may falsify the preference we convey to others about the leader. In other words, we may choose a public preference that differs from our private preference. Now, preference falsification typically goes hand in hand with knowledge falsification. And this is the deliberate misrepresentation of our information, of our understanding of the world around us. I may know of government corruption. I may know that the government's policies are counterproductive in many ways. I may know that they are hurting many sectors, that they're doing long-term damage, yet pretend for all this that the government is honest and I may say publicly that the policies are, are working well. It could take the form, of course, of just keeping quiet when other people say that everything is uh, going well, uh, and we know that it actually isn't. Now, why do I engage in, would I engage in knowledge falsification? If I expose the corruption, I'll be suspected of being a dissenter. That will undermine my preference falsification. Social media mobs will come after me, okay? Now, uh, consider a society with three classes of players. There's the dictatorship, uh, there's a public opposition, and many people who must choose between them. So, on a zero to 100 preference scale, the dictatorship is at 100. Think of this as 100% approval of the regime and of the, the dictator. And the public opposition is at zero. Consider, consider this or think of this as full disapproval in favor of an alternative uh, system. And of course, the the dictator and his cronies uh, go. The private preferences of the members of this society are distributed along this interval. Now we'll call their average uh, private opinion. In other words, the average of all private preferences, private opinion. Each person also has a public preference and call their average public opinion. Now, I should point out that in everyday language, public opinion is used to mean one concept or, or the other. For clarity, for analytic clarity, we need this uh, distinction. These can be widely apart. Public opinion and private opinion can be uh, widely apart, and they can grow apart uh, even if they're, uh, they're close on a particular issue, they may go apart over time. At the start of our story, the dictator is in power. Think of revolution as a massive shift in public opinion against the uh, incumbent regime, a shift that is so large as to topple the incumbent uh, regime. Now, uh, remember that everyone, regardless of their private preference, has to choose between being loyal to the dictatorship and being publicly opposed. Of course, this is a simplification, but it, uh, it is for, uh, it has an analytic reason. That decision uh, can change over time. A loyalist may become a dissident and, and vice versa. Uh, 
one of the determinants of whether a person switches is the size of the public opposition. If Navalny is alone, a Russian citizen will be terrified of opposing Putin. And, I, and when I say Navalny is alone, I mean is, is alone in steadfastly opposing the uh, regime. But if 30% of Russians are already dissenters publicly, the risk is less. If nothing else, there's security in, in numbers. Another determinant of switching in the pro-opposition direction is one's private preference. If you like the opposition's agenda genuinely, you'll switch more readily, holding everything else uh, constant, uh, than if you genuinely think Putin is doing fine. Okay. Generally, at any given time, each person has a threshold such that he'll switch or she'll switch to the opposition if a certain percentage have gone first. That's the person's threshold for rebelling. People can differ in their rebellion thresholds. One person may join a rebellion if 10 persons are already uh, protesting. For someone else, equally angry, the threshold might be uh, uh, 30%. So using this concept, let's go through a quick thought exercise that I've used uh, uh, before. Imagine a society consisting of 10 people. Each person has a rebellion threshold, and I've deliberately lined them up in increasing uh, order. A threshold of zero means that you're in opposition no matter what. Even in prison, under torture, you'll keep denouncing the regime, speaking of its corruption. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, there were very courageous open dissenters in the Soviet uh, bloc. One thinks of Solzhenitsyn, of Havel, of Saharov, and there are, of course, many, many uh, more. There's Navalny in uh, Russia today, as I, as I said. At the other extreme, you have a person who is for the status quo, no matter what. In Russia today, officials who owe everything to Putin and who were subject to being blackmailed by Putin, people on, on whom Putin has a file, a very potentially damaging file, these people fall into this category. They will stay with them till, uh, till the end. But in between, you have people who are movable, politically movable. It's these eight people in between who are going to drive events. Take the person in the fifth position. He has a threshold of 40. If the share of protesters or the share of people who have publicly identified as opponents of the regime, if it's below 40%, he's gonna stay with the regime. If it reaches 40% or higher, he'll join the protesters uh, himself, okay? Now here's our initial condition. Uh, one person, 10% of society is in opposition, 90% are uh, pro-regime, okay? Now, the, an alternative outcome is this. Nine persons, 90% of society in opposition, and the diehard regime supporter is left alone. Now, the regime can't survive with that share of society openly in rebellion. Now, notice that this is, uh, this is a stable uh, stable public opinion, if 90% happen to be in opposition, they're against the Putin regime, 90% will stay in opposition. Because for each of the first nine people, their threshold is below uh, 90. Now, but we're not uh, uh, there Yet we are uh, we are in this uh, this position, or this 
sequence, uh, threshold uh, sequence is what we have. The opposition is at 10%. Something has to happen to get the opposition to start feeding on itself. Now, what can get the process uh, started? Look at the pivotal individuals here. They're individuals two and uh, three. Suppose that one of them, let's say individual uh, two, becomes even more disillusioned with the status quo. One more humiliation at a government office sends her over the edge. Or her son is brutalized by the police when, she, when he refuses to pay a bribe. Or a cousin's coffin comes back from Ukraine. Her threshold falls from 20 to 10 because of her increasing anger. So now 20% are in opposition, 80% of society, eight of the 10 people are with the uh, regime. Now with this change, the opposition is large enough to induce person three to join the opposition. Person three joins the opposition. So now the share of society in opposition is 30%. That induces then person four to join the opposition, go to 40%. So you can see that you can see the chain reaction. This chain reaction will continue until nine people are in opposition. Here you have near unanimous public opposition that is, uh, that is too much for, for the regime to bear and it topples uh, and the regime uh, uh, falls. Now, the uh, society has moved explosively from stable dictatorship, the top sequence here, to uh, stable support for a new regime you see that the old regime was highly vulnerable. A slight change in one threshold set in motion a process that uh, caused it to collapse. But the vulnerability of the regime will not necessarily be known before the shock. Why? Because rebellion thresholds are not common knowledge. They are known only to the individual himself or herself. Now, in the heuristic threshold sequence at the top here that we've uh, uh, quickly uh, discussed, per person two's disillusionment pushed society explosively from stable dictatorship to stable support for a new regime. It triggered a, lo a long cascade. Look now at the, at the second sequence. It's a slightly different sequence. The only difference is in the threshold of person three. It's probably indistinguishable ex ante from the, uh, the outsiders uh, from the first uh, sequence. What we get then is not a revolution in response to the shock. What we get is not a revolution, but a growth in opposition from 10% to 20%. So there's no, uh, uh, there's no cascade. Now look at uh, the third sequence now. The average threshold is much lower. Okay. And that could be driven by the fact that there's much more discontent much more uh, anger at the regime, but these, but of course the thresholds are known only to the individual players uh, themselves. Given that the thresholds reflect private preferences and political incentives, individual political incentives, the political trajectory is sensitive also to these uh, variables. And it's sensitive, the uh, political trajectory is sensitive uh, in ways that are invisible to the players, including not just other citizens, but also the regime and the opposition, and of course, outside uh, observers. 
Now, lots can happen before a critical mass forms. People can become increasingly ready to rebel on the verge of switching sides without giving a public indication. Before November 1989, East Germans were becoming increasingly disillusioned with communism, with Soviet domination, with a dysfunctional economy, with lack of freedoms, with East German backwardness relative to West Germany, but in public, nothing was changing. Nothing caught the tension as harbingers of the collapse that was to uh, come. Today, this could be the case in Russia, or for that matter, in Egypt and Turkey and Venezuela and other uh, autocracies. We would not know, though, until the surprise happens. Now, uh, a revolution is, that was unpredicted could be easily explained in retrospect. I want to uh, emphasize this. And this is consistent with the, with the model's logic. In the aftermath of an unanticipated revolution, long repressed grievances burst out into the open. Moreover, people who were relatively content with the old regime, embrace the new one. Why? They want to be avoid being persecuted as potential counter-revolutionaries. They pretend that their support for the old regime was never genuine, that it was performative. They pretend that they were falsifying their preferences for self-preservation. Now, in falsifying their preferences in favor of the new regime or whitewashing their old preferences, they make the toppled regime appear even more vulnerable than it actually was. And so this makes it easier to, or all the easier to explain what happened. After a regime change, not only do people free, speak freely about the horrors of the old regime, but some of them distort their ex ante preferences and uh, incentives. Before a revolution, preference falsification conceals the potential for a successful revolt. After the fact, it masks the factors that were working against change. So ex ante, the outcome is unpredictable, ex post, it's overdetermined. Okay. Now, uh, Many scholars write about the survival of specific dictators or, or uh, dictatorships, whether Putin's Russia or Sisi's uh, Egypt. A theme, a uh, common theme is that autocratic survival is based on brute repression. Experts point to jailings and killings of dissenters. They point to official harassment of nonconformists. Official brutality is indeed a factor in in Russia and Egypt and other autocracies. Examples are, are plentiful, but official rep repression is not necessarily the most crucial element. There are times of relatively little physical repression. In many areas, contexts, professions, the dictatorship is not sustained just through brute force or even mainly through uh, brute force. It's sustained by a general willingness to support the regime in public. People join organizations whose mission they uh, opposed. They attend pro-regime -re rallies against their uh, will. They applaud speakers whose message they dislike. They go out of their way to praise the dictator. We, we see this in, in Russia today, in Egypt and Turkey, uh, et cetera. In short, they engage in many forms of preference falsification and knowledge falsification. And in the process of doing this, they scare each other into submission. But the very phenomenon, preference and uh, phenomena, preference and knowledge falsification can also seal a regime's fate if ever it becomes vulnerable. If support for the opposition attains a critical mass, fear will change sides. The anti-regime cascade will gain momentum. People will go out of their way then to talk about the dictatorship, dictatorship's 
crimes and bad policies. Now, before I end with policy implications for undermining an existing autocracy, let me re-emphasize that there are limits to what we can know about the autocracy's survivability. Now, this is for two reasons. Individual public preferences are interdependent, which makes public opinion a nonlinear function of individual characteristics. Intuitively, the sensitivity of public opinion to changes in individual dispositions, changes in individual motives, uh, it, it's, it, it, this sensitivity is not fixed, but variable. And the variability allows the consequences of any given shock to be disproportionately large or disproportionately small. For example, massive changes in private preferences may leave public opinion undisturbed, only to be followed by a minuscule change that transforms public opinion uh, erratically. But this is not enough. These interdependencies among public preferences are not public knowledge, they're private knowledge. So we can't know in advance about the effects of a given switch to the uh, opposition. Where preference falsification is rampant, as it is in an autocracy, we may not realize that an incumbent political equilibrium is about to vanish. Now, absent the, the, the second uh, uh, factor, imperfect observability, we would always be aware of approaching breaks in society's political evolution. We would be able to see a revolution coming. We'd know what the, uh, the relationship between a shock and public opinion. Absent the first condition, interdependent of public uh, preferences, small changes in individual dispositions would not, could not produce explosive changes in public uh, opinion. So both are important. So uh, the limits of knowledge that I've highlighted provide good news and bad news for any entity or any coalition that wants to topple an autocracy. You may think of the autocracy as Russia's incumbent uh, regime. Now, starting with the bad news, initiatives aimed at weakening it will not necessarily bear results quickly. They can appear ineffective for a while. And this apparent <clears throat> ineffectiveness can lead to restlessness among the funders of the, uh, uh, among the, uh, uh, the people who are working on the initiatives. They can discourage the, uh, the funders. The uh, apparent ineffectiveness can make initiatives seem hopeless. Initiatives have to be launched without guarantee of short-term results in terms of destabilizing the uh, regime visibly. Now, the good news is that there may be hidden successes. Various initiatives may be destabilizing the targeted dictatorship. It may be becoming increasingly vulnerable to negative shocks. Now, what kind of initiatives do I have in mind? Well, publicizing dissent, public uh, dissent and private dissent uh, through all available means, publicizing regime failures through all available means. This kind of publicity can move private preferences against the regime. It can make people in the targeted uh, country uh, cease believing that the regime is invincible. It may split the regime as opportunistic officials sense the destabilization and jump ship. I have in mind also policies that inflict damage on the regime. In the case of Russia, damage can take the form, of course, of casualties, uh, economic isolation, uh, 
uh, depriving its uh, economic sectors of, uh, of inputs, uh, forcing it to uh, have to resort to uh, conscription, uh, undermining its narrative in uh, one way or uh, another, its narrative about the about the war, about uh, uh, about Ukrainian history, and so on. Lack of immediate and visible success does not imply that the damage is ineffective, that the, that the policies are, are ineffective. These are, of course, initiatives, the ones that I've listed here, these are, of course, initiatives that are already being pursued. My point, the point I want to make uh, is that lack of visible results uh, shouldn't be or lack of uh, evidence of destabilization, of weakening of the regime, shouldn't be interpreted ev as evidence of policy failure. The damage being done to stability may be hidden from, from view. So uh, let me thank you and uh, uh, stop here. And I, I welcome uh, questions or, uh, or comments. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this um, extensive and very deep lecture. Uh, we agreed to have about twenty minutes of uh, Q and A session. I see that there is already one question in the chat, and I encourage everyone to type their questions in Q and A. I will read out loud the first one. It's by Maxim Chebatarov, who uh, who is our frequent uh, guest of of these lectures. So he says, um, since you are an expert in the interpretation of hidden instability signs, is there already a writing on the wall for Russia? So, yeah, I think this gentleman wants to know your, you know, predictions about what's going to happen with this regime in Russia. So I would, I would suggest that uh, based on uh, other societies, based on Russian, Russian history, that uh, there are, there is a great deal of hidden discontent. There are a lot of people who would like to change the regime, but knowing that there's a lot of preference falsification. There's likely to be a lot of preference falsification under the circumstances that there's likely to be a lot of knowledge falsification does not give one the ability or the capacity to predict what it's going to take to topple uh, Russia's uh, regime, what kind of shock would, uh, would ultimately lead to the type of cascade I uh, talked about. Now, uh, I might suggest that someone who understood extremely well the process that I'm uh, that I've described uh, was uh, Václav Havel. He uh, he's the person who suggested, uh, and many people disagreed with him. Uh, many people laughed at him. He suggested that when uh, that uh, the Soviet system was very vulnerable, that it would that it could collapse, it probably would collapse suddenly and surprise people. Yet he himself didn't see the tea leaves, didn't see the signs of the coming uh, uh, the the coming collapse, the nineteen eighty nine uh, revolutions. When Gorbachev came to, went to Prague, uh, this was just weeks before uh, the uh, uh, the uh, revolutions uh, started. When he went to Prague, uh, enormous crowds greeted Gorbachev, and uh, there was enthusiasm that was unprecedented in uh, communist uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Havel was asked then, 
does this indicate that there's going to be another Prague Spring? And he said, his answer was, stop dreaming. He, he himself was pessimistic. Khomeini, the, the, the mastermind of the Iranian revolution, understood very well that there, was, there were rivers of uh, discontent in Iranian society. He formed a coalition against the, uh, the Shah. He didn't believe this, this was going to uh, uh, succeed. He thought that the, he thought the demonstrations would, would weaken it, the regime. He thought that, the, uh, that, uh, uh, that one had to keep pushing. He worked toward that. But to his close associates, he was saying that he would not live to, uh, to see it. So the, the short answer is that I don't have uh, any special information beyond what I read in the press and what you read in, in the press about how vulnerable uh, uh, Putin is. But I would, I would suggest, given uh, that uh, it, it is probably uh, substantial and um, many people must be on the fence. Yes, thank you. And I also see there is a question on YouTube. So I just want to remind that we broadcast our lectures on YouTube and you can ask questions there as well. Uh, Lisa Pushista, she says, thank you for your lecture. But what about the regime's agency and their ability to sway, manage public opinion? Uh, where is their agency in your model? Should it be included? So, uh, of course, the, the regime itself understands the process. And just as I, on, on the slide you see here, I talk about policies to weaken the regime. Of course, the regime pursues policies to, uh, uh, pursues counter policies, tries to uh, protect itself, uh, punishing dissenters, uh, making a spectacle uh, of them as Russia is doing to uh, Navalny. Uh, uh, punishing reporters who spread uh, information that harms the regime. These are all uh, all uh, uh, example. These are all examples. But just as the uh, uh, opposition uh, is operating on the basis of imperfect information, so is the regime. The very fears that the regime creates makes it difficult for the regime to, uh, to spot uh, uh, pockets of dissent in society. Now, they know, knowing this, all repressive regimes conduct polls designed to give people, uh, designed to give people uh, uh, the, uh, the citizens anonymity. But how uh, successful, but they're not, these polls are not as revealing generally as polls in free societies. Because even though they try to give people a sense that their answers will not be used against them, the very conditions that the regime has created uh, can, uh, can lead to mis misleading answers. Not only that, uh, if you're going to, for, for uh, uh, des designing a representative poll is difficult in a representative, uh, in, in, uh, society, in a society, because you don't, if you're trying to identify pockets of uh, uh, dissent, you need to, uh, uh, it's easier, the more open society, society is. So uh, yes, the regime is not explicitly modeled, but implicitly just as the opposition is not explicitly modeled, but they face the same type of uh, uh, problem. And this is why regimes themselves are uh, uh, often surprised by, uh, by uh, turns of events. Yeah, thank you. So since I don't see any more questions, I would like to ask my own, and it's going to be a bit broad. Um, 
and maybe a bit speculative, but I guess that's you know a privilege to have you with us so we can speculate about things. So we had a few more uh, guests. We had people like Bruce Bueno de Mosquita, who works on the selectorate theory. Uh, we will have Charles Boish, who also works in the field of regime change, and uh, Susan Stokes from Chicago. So they all presented you know, their own theories about how uh, authoritarian regimes evolve and change and can become democratic or go into tyranny. And curiously, almost everyone is talking about economic inequality in slightly different dimensions, but they all are talking about uh, economic inequality, the shape of the uh, Gini curve, et cetera. Do you find this um, topic as relevant for your model? Uh, do you connect economic inequalities with uh, uh, preference classification, or these are just two you know, unrelated realms that cannot be combined in, in one model? Uh, I think these. I think these are actually complementary. I, I think that economic inequality can be a source of uh, discontent. We uh, we are living in a in a period as we tra transition from the industrial era to the digital era, where uh, uh, there are, uh, many plates are 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 shifting, and this is uh, generating a great deal of inequality all across the. Of the world, some professions are are disappearing. Their uh, their value is diminishing. New professions are emerging. The same thing happened in the during the transition from uh, the agricultural era to the industrial era. So inequality is uh, is definitely a factor. It's definitely a source of discontent in Russia. Uh, it is it is certainly uh, a factor. You have uh, there's a lot of resentment. Uh, uh, of the uh, Russian oligarchs and uh, the lives they uh, they lead, there are people who have not benefited as much as uh, uh, certainly as as them, but who have benefited considerably less than the average from uh, from economic growth. So, uh, uh, so, so this it, it certainly is a, is a factor here, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think, as, as I said, these uh, arguments are uh, complementary. This can be uh, this can be among the factors that are uh, uh, turning people against uh, Putin. But I would suggest that they are not necessarily the growing inequalities are not necessarily the most important factor. Cultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, factors can be uh, can be equally important, if not more important, for some people. This is why uh, all around uh, the world, uh, people who are trying to uh, change a regime uh, uh, dramatically uh, resort to uh, or uh, deepen try to deepen cultural cleavages. This is true with. Uh, uh, Le Pen's movement in in France. It's true of uh, uh, Trump. It's true of Putin, of Erdogan in in Turkey. They uh, they try to uh, switch attention, their people's attention, from these inequalities to uh, to uh, uh, cultural issues and to cultural uh, uh, grievances. Now, uh, of course, whether it works is going to, and how well it works, the, these efforts to shift attention from inequalities to cultural issues, how well they uh, work is going, to de is going to depend on the circumstances. In Turkey, where uh, the impoverishment of large segments of the population is immense, even people who are with Erdogan on cultural issues are now turning against them. And uh, the this, this same uh, sort of thing can happen in Russia if uh, somehow uh, his oil revenue is reduced and uh, his, his economy takes big hits. 
Yeah, thank you. There is, um, of course, this is a huge topic. I know the sociological side of this debate. Since I'm a sociologist, I follow this um, this literature on populism and mobilization. Quite a lot of scholars now work on this field of um, identities and threat to identities. So the argument is once people have the subjective um, feeling that their social identity is threatened and social identity is a construct you know it can be about your um, native land your ethnic group your even your social class yeah? you can mobilize around this uh, uh, feeling and um, and act in political realm so I'm, I'm really enjoying you talking about you know culture and versus economic um, uh, preferences oh, absolutely the identity is uh, uh also the, the clashes over identity are also clashes about inequality it's always the case that you have in these clashes of identity that people who are asserting an identity are uh or different identity or who are uh who want their identity to be uh, recognized or who are, are claiming that they are victims, that they are uh, also, and, and this victimization includes uh, economic disadvantages. And uh, so they go, these, these things reinforce uh, one another. Sometimes uh, a clash of identities is an expression of discontent over inequalities economic inequalities partly, uh, uh, and they're related. And economic inequalities are correlated with certain, with uh, class distinctions and ethnic distinctions and so on. So they, so they actually uh, uh, feed on each other. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you for uh, your take on that. And uh, we don't have any more questions. Um, and I think it's a um, good time uh, to conclude this uh, meeting. Um, thank you very much for your lecture once again. It's, a, it's an honor to have you and to spend an hour with you. And I want to remind our audience that uh, there, there is still a work in progress. Uh, Timur Kuran is an editor of a journal in Cooperative Economics. And together we are working on a special issue uh, dedicated to Ukraine and the crisis in Ukraine. Um, and also um, I encourage everyone to follow our, our social media. We will host more uh, lectures soon and we will have a lecture by Charles Boish in the end of September, who is also an expert on, on this topic of uh, democratic change and, um, uh, and authoritarian regimes. So oh, thank you very much, um, uh, Timur. We'll we'll stay in touch, and I hope we will see you in uh, in peaceful Ukraine in person with more fantastic lectures. Well, thank you very much, Timur. This has been uh, a privilege to do this, and I uh, greatly enjoyed it. Thank you, and thank you also for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. bye.